So hello everyone, my name is Wes Bush. I'm the founder of the Product Led Summit. And today I am so excited to share with you Mickey, who is the CTO of Gainsight PX. And so Gainsight PX was actually Aptrinsic not too long ago. And so Mickey founded Aptrinsic and really has been helping a lot of different companies really prioritize and figure out how to create better product experiences. So before we really dive into the topic, which is how to create a product-led growth strategy, I want to just hear from your side, Mickey. Like what gave you the impetus to really start Aptrinsic in the first place? Hi, Wes. Yes, as an entrepreneur, I'm always inspired to build technologies that really helps companies deliver better customer experience at scale. Um, I was also the CEO and co-founder of Insightera, a web personalization platform. Well, back then, the online channel was the main experience channel. I joined Marketo as part of the Insightera acquisition and led Marketo's global engineering team. Back then, during that time, uh, we built and launched several new products. And I realized that in the subscription business, the new experience channel is becoming the product itself. So creating a Prinzic was driven by the fact that products are the new growth engines. And to build better products, you need visibility to usage. So you can better prioritize. Um, and you need also to be able to tie usage to bookings and revenue and being really close to the growth of your company. You also need, as part of your release process, to think about how to quickly collect qualitative user feedback and to do it at scale. And you also want to be proactive with more contextualized onboarding. Contextualized onboarding means that you want to drive adoption as part of releasing new features, and this is, I think one of the basic elements to uh, product like growth, which we're going to talk about today. Um, and I can definitely agree, especially with the consumeritization of technology where people are using apps and so much technology in their personal lives. And whenever it comes to even just business, we have those same expectations. It's, it's got to be easy to use. And really, we want to get to that time to value as soon as possible. So that's great. I love that you start App Transic and now Gainside PX, you're doing really well with it. And so I love to really just take it a step further and hear your thoughts on product like growth. So I know you put together an amazing presentation. And so feel free to just dive in. Great. So let's start. So we spoke about myself. I was also the co-author of Mastering Product Experience. The book is available online. Uh, we basically address the tactics of product-led growth in that book. So to start with, I want to go over the go-to-market evolution we're seeing in the market today. Starting really with the sales-led model, where customer acquisition was led by sales. And that was part of the experience. That model was not that scalable. We also uh, experienced higher ACV, of course, but it wasn't really easy to address a bigger market uh, and do it efficiently. Then came the product-assisted go-to market, um, driven mainly by customer expectations to try the product early in the buying process. Um, and obviously, as part of the subscription business, that, become, that became a very substantial uh, go-to market uh, strategy. Uh, and in recent days, what we're seeing is the product-led approach. As discussed, the product is becoming the growth engine for companies. Um, and in this model, we're, what we're seeing is that features and usage are the primary drivers for customer acquisition, retention, and expansion. And great examples for that can be with Slack and Box and some other, um, what we call today, unicorn that adopted that strategy, which we're going to discuss in the next couple of slides. So first, I want to look at the marketing-led growth strategy. In this strategy, companies really force prospects to jump through hoops, such as filling out lead forms and uh, requesting free trial. Um, in many cases, marketing is nurturing customers uh, using the website and email. Uh, but as a customer, I'm not really realizing any value and the flow 
Um, and time to take for me to really meet the product is quite uh, some time because I'm trying to figure out if your product can really deliver on my needs and can solve my pain points. Um, another perspective to look at is really the focus in marketing. It's not about the customer at all. In this uh, go-to-market strategy, the, the focus of the company is really to drive marketing qualified leads and then also uh, having sales qualify them as well as sales qualify leads. And we've seen the, the challenges in these type of uh, strategies, trying to figure out is really the, the prospect ready to buy because they just read some content and sales uh, always would come in and need to again qualify them. Uh, is this really the right time? And there's no really good way to do that. Another uh, element here is product teams which are building these products are not really part of that uh, customer acquisition uh, flow. And that's really surprising because these guys are responsible for delivering the product that needs to be able to be sold and is basically pitched by marketing. Looking at the product-led growth strategy, in this model, as a customer, the product itself is becoming the experience. Um, companies are much more customer-centric right now. It's all about the customer experience. And companies provide access to products early in the buying cycle through trials or freemium. Um, and they do personalize each customer's journey as part of it. Um, also, companies are moving from MQLs, SQL to product qualified leads. And really focus on the customer value throughout the customer life cycle. Um, last thing to notice is really product teams increasingly are more responsible for the customer acquisition metrics, which ends up driving them focusing on the usability of the product before building more features. They want to make sure that you're experiencing value as a prospect. So the key drivers for product-led growth um, is starting from the consumerization of customer expectation. We are using application today as part of our day-to-day life, and when we are using a B2B platform, we do expect that to drive value. We're paying good money for that, and we do expect that seamless experience as we are using Google Maps and using Yelp and so forth. Um, the economics behind fast growth is also becoming a competitive advantage. We are, if you're able to drive demand through your product, and if you're able to make sure that as part of that, as part of product qualified leads, you are quite sure that that prospect is ready to buy. They experience your product at scale and very quickly. You can create a much faster funnel and much more efficient marketing and sales team. And we're also seeing with the product-led approach, there are shorter cycles to launch new features. You can also experiment and learn faster and innovate. And if you're very close to your customer as they're trying your new features or as you're, as a product leader, look at your trial experience in the first mile of product. And we're seeing a lot of uh, uh, B2B enterprises become unicorn today. So we're seeing how they took the experience as an essential part and also become very customer centric. And it's not just B2C. We obviously see here great names in, in B2B. And these guys were implementing some of the principles we're going to talk about now in the next couple of slides. So let's talk about creating a product led strategy. The first element we want to talk about is really define the North Star metric. Really the metric that measure the success and outcome that your product drives to your customers. Uh, the North Star metric coming from Marketo for me can be a conversion rate. I know that the CMO that drives demand wants to make sure that the conversion rate is high. So if he's able to measure that as part of Marketo, that would be a great North Star metric. In every customer, in every product, you should have a North Star metric that you can align and focus the team behind it. You obviously in B2B, especially in the platform use case, when you have different buyers and you have different personas, you wanna break that North Star metric to um, 
tactics and implementations and goals that your product team wants to achieve towards that North Star metric. So in doing the customer journey, they obviously want to onboard them into the core features and value of your product that will lead eventually to that North Star, which is driving the best outcome of that platform. So the next element is really transparent pricing. At Gainsight PX, we eat our own dog food or drink our own champagne. Uh, transparent, price, transparent pricing is really key. Uh, whether if you have a freemium or a trial, um, you want to message that there's no upfront commitment. Um, you want to differentiate by premium features or usage. But transparent, transparent pricing is all about um, having your prospect understand what the value of your product is delivering, but also what the budget they need to think about. Uh, otherwise, they might assume it's a complex product, it's expensive product, it might not be the best timing, and their decision is going to be way, way heavier in that uh, aspect. So applying a paywall uh, in B2B, not just in B2C, we're seeing more and more, obviously, manage trials or premium levels. When a prospect or a user is hitting that threshold, you want to expose them to the relevant features, but also block them um, as part of it. So there's many tactics to uh, choose which features drive value and can stay free or part of a POC and which features should be paid for. Um, the rule of thumb would be that it should be very clear to your customer what is the extended value. They should be able to drive value from the freemium level or if it's a, just a trial, they need to be able to achieve um, the first value that your product uh, delivers. And then as they grow, as they grow with their usage and they value the more advanced features, this is where you can apply and extend that uh, paywall. And most customers will be happy to pay for more value. So we are also in an incremental pricing model that today that that is more acceptable. I want to try I want to start uh, small, I want to experience value, and as I grow, I'm happy to become an advocate, I'm happy to sell, to buy more, uh, especially when I realize that Delta, and I, I realize the value of that Delta I'm paying for, as opposed to, as opposed to really uh, pay upfront and give you a, a multi-year commitment. So the key here is really to determine which features to provide for free or full access during the trial and which one to lock up. I do advise to expose most of your features, of all your features, for example, uh, and then using the, the paywall as a means to block or uh, allow them to just have a taste as opposed to not showing them. Not showing the feature means that they won't necessarily know that you have that. Another very important element, if you're able to do it, is really uh, making your product viral. Um, obviously, you want to build products that uh, uh, are becoming part of the daily routine and uh, make it really easy to onboard new users. That's the one element that uh, will enable your product to become viral. Um, marketing and growth theme, as we can see in this example, are also pushing you to refer a friend and get some rewards. There's a give and take relationship with your customers and I think uh, viral and enabling growth loop will help you scale very quickly. And that's one of the key elements in, in product growth and we're seeing that naturally in B2C and now also in B2B that building those growth loop, enabling your product to expand um, allow your customers when they start using it, invite their colleagues to collaborate and also even refer uh, other customers to that product. Another very important element is frictionless onboarding. It starts from ungating sign up and really focusing on quick time to value. Um, as prospects, especially in B2B, we are very, very busy. Uh, and the fact that today with the subscription business, I can enable prospect to go into the product and experience value can be a key to a fast 
growth and can be a key to enable adoption. In the past, in the marketing-led growth approach, as remember, I would submit a form, I might have an SDR follow-up, there's a very long process. I am already doing something else as a prospect, I'm obviously busy, so in a few minutes, I'm gonna lose my attention, and we are now fighting for attention span. So frictionless onboarding and allowing virality into an expansion is a, a very part of the, one of the pillars to product growth or product led growth uh, approach. We've got them into the product right now and now the next thing to focus on is the user onboarding and the user experience. So one of the basic tips is really master the first uh, interaction. You wanna set the user expectation to what's gonna happen in B2B, sometimes tend to be, you need to build something, you need to configure something, Setting the right expectation, as we're seeing in the, in the left area, um, I'm showing there three elements or three outcomes that you might want to achieve. I'm actually asking the user which one they are interested, most interesting to achieve. So I'm, if I know what they're trying to achieve, if there's one value to my product initially, I can just drive into that value and explain. If there are a couple of values and a couple of personas and I don't know who just signed up, I can ask them. And this is a great way to build that uh, first mile of product, this journey. Um, so capturing the desired outcome is also very important. You, even through a, an in-app survey, you want to collect that initial feedback. And so you, when you do reach out or when you do build this uh, multi-state journey for your customers, you always can go back to what was the reason, what was the outcome that prospect would signed up for? So either using um, in-app surveys and forms, using in-app guides, um, and engaging users, using even both is great, so you can learn and serve your customer better. Um, the more advanced scenario we're seeing is really building a nurture track to your customers. Especially in B2B, we know there's a couple of steps and goals they need to achieve before they experience value. So you want to um, map that journey and build automated nurture track so you can do it at scale, you can measure, optimize, uh, and experiment with that, with that type of automation. Accelerate time to value. That's obviously a very important point. Uh, we spoke about the consumerization of customer expectation. We are, we want to be able to achieve something very quickly. We are running from one meeting to another. We are always multitasking. So time to value for us is key. And to hook users into your platform, time to value should be one of the initial and first thing you want to focus on. So understanding and optimize the first mile of product towards the moment of value. And the moment of value is an example, if I was using Zoom, the moment of value is, is a, a conference call, a video call that I'm sharing with someone. Uh, if it's Google Doc, the collaboration and the, the fact that Google is basically storing my docs online. Uh, so the first moment of value is key. You wanna drive them towards that set the expectation, measure that they are following the right uh, path. Obviously, as a B2B platform, you have many, many features. So in that scenario, you want to make sure that you put as a goal the first moment of value, measure the path they're taking today. You can also guide them and build in up uh, routes to that first moment of value and obviously collect feedback uh, for, to learn quickly about that experience and always looking at the first mile of product. Um, you want to identify challenges, you're always uh, adding more and more features and your product might become more complex. Uh, so be careful not to lose sight of that first time to value. Um, and then prioritize product roadmap to make that first initial touch as a, a initial sign up as exceptional as, a, as you can do. Uh, because today, especially when you enable signups uh, in a free trial or freemium, that will actually what is going to determine the success of your product. So really accelerate time to value is key. Today, we are looking at more and more uh, time to value that is becoming not months, not weeks, days and minutes. It actually becomes days and minutes. 
even if you're a B2B platform. It's a key factor uh, to gain and onboard users and, and basically acquire more customer uh, and getting them to become advocates. So really figuring that out is very, very important in a product-led approach. Going now into tactics, once you're building more and more features, feature activation, um, and as I said before, contextualized engagement, being proactive is a big difference. And as a product team, you want to look at the, a growth strategy. In some companies, we're seeing growth teams that are composed from um, product managers, engineers, product marketing, uh, focusing on those activation points uh, to make sure that uh, onboarding and growth is enabled depend on different uh, stage of your company. You might want to focus on the first mile of uh, product, maybe your early stage or it's signups, trial conversion. If you are a very mature enterprise, it's more retention focus and expansion strategy. Your feature activation is a great way to um, make sure that they realize the value you're re releasing new features. Do not move to the next feature before that is activated. And feature activated mean that I'm contextualizing the experience. I'm showing you that feature um, when it's relevant, when it's helpful for you to use it. And we're seeing that uh, very often with, with P2C products and, um, and large companies are doing that today, uh, like Google, for example. So when you search, they can show you that they can search even images and so forth. So feature activation, key path, part of uh, driving adoption. The way to do it is raise feature awareness. Uh, you can use outbound efforts first, telling them what's coming. Uh, you can even share better programs with uh, early adopters of your product. Uh, obviously promote in context um, experiences based on who they are and what they do. Make sure it's really relevant for them. Some features are for early um, adopters or advanced users. Some are just for onboarding. Make sure you're not mixing them. Um, increasing discoverability of really your golden features is also important. If you've figured out that some of the features are heavily used, are sticky features, you want to increase their discoverability, it's very easy in web application to create additional links. So part of your analysis and feature activation, one of them is going to be the engagement, how effective is the engagement, um, and then the second part is if you find a golden feature, make sure it's, a, it's visible in more places when it's relevant. Um, really important to understand that you don't wanna build more features before the core features are being adopted. Uh, if you're an early stage company, make sure that you figure out your core feature before you're driving to the next one. You might have uh, an urge to build those more and more differentiated features, but guess what, your customers, and the early majority would not would find very hard to understand that differentiation. They are not going that deep as you may think. So making sure that first you make sure that your initial features are being adopted, uh, well understood. You iterate over them. You improve their usability, um, and then you move on to the next feature. Otherwise, you end up with the classic product death cycle when you're launching features and you're reporting great success and adoption, but we know over time there's a drop and then the next feature, the next feature is coming. So there's always a balance where to, uh, when to launch new features and when to keep focusing on usability and keeping your product very, very focused on the outcome it needs to drive before it goes to the next product. Sometimes it's also a, it's a multi-product strategy. So in the same notion, know when to introduce the new, the new product as opposed to early time. In at Beckett Marketo, as an example, um, we were trying to feed customer with all of Marketo products and it wasn't that successful. Initially, we knew that, uh, and what we learned is they need first to complete the usage and adoption of the core Marketo platform before we are able to take into the next stage, which is the website personalization and predictive analytics and so forth. Trying to push all at once uh, as product uh, is not a, a successful path. 
focusing on product adoption makes a lot of sense. Uh, but again, we're seeing that where a company struggles or there's any notion of uh, growth metrics, the, the immediate outcome and decision is to build more product to go after a new market. Focusing on adoption and avoiding leaky bucket is really key. And in B2B, there's a different perspective on adoption. It's not just the renewal. You want to be able to know way ahead of the renewal date. Um, in, so in this scenario, what we're looking at is really behavioral retention. It means that users that signed up are coming back to the product. And one of the most important things to do is to measure that either based on their sign up date, of course, but also the value action that they are taking within your product. This value action can teach you what's working and what's not. And a, if you figure out uh, the, the, how to deliver those initial uh, valuable features and customer learn how to use it, they will come back and use it for more and you will see uh, the retention is going up you should see a, a good re behavioral retention graph should be above 30% and should be going up into a smiley face if you're able to deliver more value over time. So looking at 12 weeks as minimum, looking at sign up date and looking at value action is very, very important when you measure behavioral retention. Guess what? If you're not doing that, you might end up in trying to predict just based on the renewal and based on the, those one-on-one -on -one discussion you might have with the customer, you, with your champion, for example, you're going to miss out on the real uh, fact that you might have a champion, they're very happy, but if you know, the, the other users within the same account are not using the product as often as you thought, and you end up in a churn issue, or basically it's not really a sticky situation. So the first thing that changed, they will churn. And in hindsight, you were able to see it if you were measuring the right value action and their behavior and interaction with your product. And remember today, the product is the main interaction channel with the customer. So it's really key for you to measure that behavior. Again, a very common sense, build sticky features. Uh, one of the points I want to make here is sometimes a very common feature, um, not differentiated, very simple, might be a very sticky one as well. It doesn't mean a sticky feature is not necessarily and often is not the same as differentiated feature. But that sticky feature drives value and will make your customer invest more uh, in your platform and basically stick, stick with it. So it, in many cases, it's low hanging fruit. It's not part of what the value of your platform is. Uh, for example, if you have uh, a, a very advanced predictive analytics uh, solution and you're, you're feeling that building alerts is not a high value feature, but guess what? If people are gonna build more and more alerts on top of your platform, it's gonna be sticky. Another example, a, a, there's a couple of log uh, analysis tools that uh, most of the engineering are using. Um, they also provide now alerts and some other uh, value-added services. Um, the more I can build with your product, the stickier it can be. And if you're giving me additional things to go do, even connect that with chat, connect with more collaboration to deliver a simple feature, we'll create it uh, as more sticky uh, product as well. And so that is where you need to find the balance and to invest also in simplified features because as a customer, sometimes I want you to be integrated, but in other aspect, I actually want you to deliver and allow me to use your product. One, one element might be even chat. You know, I, might want to be able to chat and collaborate through your product as opposed to jump out of the product and use some other feature. So that is uh, with regards to sticky feature. A very, very important element is really closed loop feedback. Uh, in this element, you want to collect qualitative feedback at scale. 
using in-app feedback is very powerful because it tends to have a very high response rate. When do I collect the feedback? Normally when uh, I launch a feature and someone that my target audience is using it, I want to collect their feedback. Um, make sure they're combining two elements. One is a score, customer effort score or rating or five-star rating. And also allow them to leave you uh, open text feedback, uh, especially asking them how can you improve, what was working, what was not. So that type of feedback when it can be specific question, what they like about your product, what's not, and also scoring specific activities and value action will help you get the right picture of what's going on as opposed to hearing that feedback from a couple of prospects that spoke with a sales rep or someone that actually spoke with your CEO. Uh, many, many feedback, uh, feedbacks out there. So having a way to collect uh, and meaningful feedback at scale you want to apply in-app feedback and look at it as a, as a product manager. Make sure you spend the time uh, and analyzing that, that type of feedback. Uh, so closed loop feedback will give you that at scale and very quickly you'll be able to know that the, the new feature you've launched has some challenges or you might even learn about ideas uh, from your customer. So in-app feedback triggered to the right audience is key. It can be numeric. It, should be also question based. Another element of feedback is allowing your customer to reach out to you with a feature request, for example. One of the amazing ideas we've built uh, and I've built during uh, my years building different products came from customers. Great ideas, especially if you're multi vertical, you'll learn about other vertical needs and high value features that to you might be a very low hanging fruit that you might be focused on. So user feedback is amazing. As you mature and you've crossed a few hundreds accounts and, and you're at the right scale as a company, uh, you wanna look at the enterprise grade ecosystem. Um, so it means that enabling seamless integrations, data sharing through uh, standard interfaces and workflow, what it does, it allows you to scale and deliver more value based on integrating with other platforms and it's expected by your clients. And if you're able to be that centric uh, platform that is even exposing that value, you will become the center, center of attention. You'll be able to deliver more value, get, become more stickier, of course, and, and become the system of record to the business you're trying to solve. So building an ecosystem is great. At Marketo, we built an ecosystem uh, for marketers integrating other vendors into the whole Marketo database, and it's proven to be a very, very successful um, execution. It's not trivial, but definitely at the right stage of a company, it's the right timing to build that ecosystem. It also involves investing uh, on your marketing, uh, towards that building a partner program, it's also investing in your product. Don't drive vendors with just slideware. They need to be able to really integrate, make sure they can verify each vendor and make sure you're uh, building a, a world-class uh, integration capabilities so we can support uh, those partners that integrate with you. Last element is really the cross-functional team effort and alignment. It's really key as well. They are not alone. It cannot be just a sales effort. It cannot be just a marketing effort. Um, as said before, in product-led approach, it's a combined effort. You have the product team, sales, marketing, customer success. We want to align behind the goals and execute a plan. So starting with marketing, uh, the focus in marketing, as said before, is on product qualified leads. You wanna enable and drive signups and you wanna make sure that you're measuring that success, who is uh, going to their product, how to have them stay in the product and, and scale. Um, a lot of work behind product launch and positioning, understanding and messaging the key features as well. Um, a lot of content uh, that basically describe how the product is being used. Uh, a lot of case studies goes a long way as part of any product adoption. Uh, and 
Another element which is pretty advanced is to use the channel to communicate um, more than just uh, in-app. In this scenario, for example, we're also promoting webinars as well. Again, if you do it with a, in a targeted fashion, you'll see a great uh, response to that. Um, as long as you're engaging that not um, in a very sensitive area in the product or not during a, a complex uh, flow, uh, you'll get high response and turning your uh, product into a communication channel and a conduit uh, to your users. Um, spoke about PQLs as well. Looking at those PQLs, the PQL concept is about the features they're uh, using during the trial. Uh, are they able to reach that moment of value? I'll give you an example for a couple of companies. If I'm using segment, for example, am I able to start tracking with segment can be the value and the PQL trigger. If I'm using SendGrid, am I able to send my first email? That's to me a signal that that customer is gonna be uh, a paying uh, customer as well. So those type of usage-based metrics and focus is really key moving from MQL to PQL. Sales um, are becoming way more proficient in the space, in the product. Uh, they are not just responsible for commercials. Be, they should be able to articulate the value and differentiation of your product. It's key today. Uh, so really becoming product-oriented sales team. Um, where you know, buyers are already using the tool, so you cannot just pitch high level value, you should also show them as, just, uh, as opposed to tell them. Uh, it's a highly hands-on experience uh, era that we are experiencing, so uh, when you engage customers and they've already seen and used your product, it's a different level of discussion. It's also more strategic. Um, you don't need to focus on basic values. You can lead them towards where is the uh, path to drive the most outcome and why should they actually pay an extra um, dollar to that value. Uh, in the product growth uh, element, uh, it's really when the sales team is engaging. Even if it's a complete self-service and we're looking at Amazon and uh, Google Cloud, it's a complete self-service, uh, but you will meet the sales team as soon as you hit a spend and usage threshold. This is where you now want to have someone on the other side, a human in person that can help you maximize value and you wanna be able to pick up the phone and uh, make sure that there's someone there to support you as you're building your business value on top of it. It's also a limited expense strategy. So uh, trying to land with a very uh, high ACV might not be the way. You might want to have a, a small deal and it's more incremental selling and then go for the large whale deal. That's the better approach today where it's more, uh, where customers want to be able to experience, feel good about the product, being able to piecemeal them into that uh, flow is, is key as well. Um, and obviously, uh, strong understanding of the competitive landscape is key as well when you're pitching something and you're uh, educating someone, uh, you might do, do a, a, the same job for the other product as well. Make sure that you understand how to position the product the best way. On the success team, uh, th that team is basically tasked to drive adoption at scale. Um, so success teams are more and more using automation and measurements to drive that, uh, the, the, that adoption at scale, uh, from onboarding to continuous adoption strategies. Um, their job is to maximize the outcome of the product. So as product leaders, make sure you align with success team, have a mutual adoption and growth goals uh, because these are the guys that are going to engage and, and make sure that the customers are achieving these goals, especially in B2B, that alignment is key. Um, meet success more often. Um, and in a product-led growth approach, success team tend to be uh, dealing with the larger accounts or the use cases that are becoming kind of the architects of the implementation at a larger scale. Um, and also, uh, again, enable in-app surveys and NPS to know 
uh, how um, the customer is really feeling. Um, Sometimes you're gonna get a different response from a customer. A face-to-face -face meeting is invaluable. Uh, but you're going to also learn that when they can just submit a, a score without um, uh, the human touch, they might reveal more than they will do in a face-to-face -face discussion. Product teams. So the road mapping is really shifting from feature-centric to outcome and growth-driven. You need to really think about what is the outcome I'm helping my customer to achieve and build around that. Uh, do not just count the number of features you're releasing. It's not really, uh, again, avoiding the product uh, death cycle, cycle it's, it's key. So shifting the mindset towards outcome, what are you trying to achieve? Can I make it easier and simpler at that scale with the product I'm, I'm offering to you? So my roadmap has to shift towards value. Um, and, uh, and not really specifically saying, hey, I've, you launched so many features and very efficient, and we are you know, uh, submitting and patching every day. Uh, that's great, but make sure that you're keeping your eyes on the ball and you're very outcome driven uh, uh, when you're building your roadmap. Um, you're also a key person to drive cross-functional alignment around growth and, and you're the product expert as well, so help them uh, help marketing and success uh, understand what you're building and make sure that uh, in this, this alignment, you, we are all aligned behind the North Star metric. We understand it and we can translate it uh, into those uh, either features, tasks, outcomes and customer success, um, all uh, behind driving that North Star metric. Um, and don't forget to prioritize usability enhancement to drive adoption. Sometimes it just takes some uh, attention, reading those feedbacks and going back and iterating on your features. Um, bear in mind, you have uh, many, many different profiles of users, whether you like it or not. First is the new user. It might be early adopter, it might be early majority, but a new user expect simple tasks to be achieved. As they start using your platform, they do expect more advanced features. They now learn about scale and they need more. Um, the early majority might uh, want to keep it simple at all times. So make sure that always uh, usability is part of what you do, especially again, if you're opening your product to uh, a free trial or you have some expansion plays and you want to introduce another product to your customer that is key to always make sure that uh, today experience uh, is uh, almost seamless. As a, if we notice in the market, experience is something that uh, is a game changer today is, and also a differentiator. People will talk about a great experience. They will become advocates because of great experience, not necessarily because of just a, a great feature you've built. So to just to summarize uh, this session, uh, really to the enterprise product success formula in a nutshell would be starting with consumer grade product experience where it's easy to learn uh, with high focus on short time to value moving from month to weeks, days, or even minutes. Uh, you will not be able to deliver this uh, white glove service to all your customers. You need to think about automation. You need to think about uh, usability. Um, make it sticky and viral, those low-hanging fruit, basic stuff that uh, is not the differentiator, but helps customers grow the usage, invite more customers, invite other prospects or the colleagues, make sure that is very visible and done well. Um, and then last thing, when it's the right time, build your enterprise grid ecosystem. This is where your um, now becoming the major player, uh, you can you'll be able to drive way more value to your customers. They are using other products, so the the sooner you're doing that ecosystem play, the 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 more the faster you get to that uh, market expansion and becoming and sustaining leadership in that market. Thank you so much for going through that. Incredible presentation, Mickey. I really enjoyed how you took it through every single team and really showed just what 
does that product-led marketing team, product-led success team look like? Because um, it is really different than a traditional sales-led and marketing-led company. Awesome. I love that strategy. And for those that really want to learn more about you and what you're up to at Gainside PX, where's the best place for them to find out more about you? Thank you very much. I was uh, Mikel On, uh, CTO and founder of Gainside PX. Uh, feel free to reach out to us. We have a product community uh, online. So we have two uh, very active communities. One is customer success. One is the product management community which you can join. Uh, you can also use the product for free. We have a free tier or a free trial if you're uh, an enterprise company. Um, and feel free to reach out to me at uh, mickey at Thank you very much.